Today we're talking about writing a particle system in 3.js. Specifically, we're going to be building out a reasonably flexible system from scratch so that you can build something like this with very little effort. Or even this, since it'll be really flexible and you can do quite a bit with it. Now, honestly, 3.js doesn't have the greatest particle support. It looks a bit weak, at least from the examples. If we go over to the 3.js site and browse the example section, Searching for particles yields very little in the way of concrete examples. I mean, some of these are kind of cool, but the code mostly relies on either points material or writing your own shader. Which is fine, it does some basic particles, but the problem here is that unless you're planning on the absolute most basic particles that don't animate or do much of anything, this isn't going to get you far. So let's make one ourselves. Now, just for reference, there are some third-party ones that various people have written in various states of support. But writing one yourself is easy, and if you're here, you're probably here to learn. What we'll start with is a super basic particle system, just getting the bones of one up and running. What I'll do is get just a few particles on the screen and nothing else. The first thing we'll be doing is using the same setup we did in the video on creating a basic 3D world, so I'll just copy that directory right into the new one. Start by defining a particle system class, and you need to do a few things. You need to create a material, need to create a buffer geometry to hold the vertex data, a list of points to be rendered, and we need to add it to the scene. Next, we'll define some particles. We'll make 10 particles to start, each with a random position. Once you've done that, we have this update geometry function, which just iterates over the list of particles and updates the buffer geometry object with properties from the particles. Separating this out as a separate function will make much more sense once we're animating parameters every frame. Lastly, we need a shader, so we'll start with the bare bones shader here. The vertex shader just transforms the position and sets the size of the point, and the fragment shader just samples the texture. So with all that done, we load it up, and here we have some particles on the screen. First thing you notice is that there's some weird issues here. When I swing the camera around, smaller or further particles seem to be drawing over top the ones that are supposed to be closer to the camera. It's because they're drawn in the order we define them, meaning we might draw a close one first, followed by a far away one after, and since we're not writing out depth values, the one that's drawn second will overwrite the first one. Let's start with just two particles as an example. It's pretty obvious from here that one is supposed to be further away than the other, depending on where the camera is. If we swing the camera around the right way, you can clearly see the further one drawing in front of the closer one. Let's go fix this. Luckily, this is an incredibly easy fix. We just sort the particles from furthest to nearest. In the comparison function, we'll compare the distance from the camera to the particle. Uh, as a side note, you can of course use distance squared. It's a minor optimization. If you know what you're doing, just go for it. But we're just going to use distance for simplicity's sake. Once we do that, load, check sorting from both angles, and you can see that it doesn't really matter which side I view the two particles from. They always seem to appear in the correct order now. And if we go and put all the particles back, let's just bump this number back up and see there's no weirdness from any angle. Let's move on to some more advanced stuff now and add some parameters that can vary from particle to particle. Let's say that we want to vary the size of each particle. There's a few things you need to do. First off, we need to go into the shader and add a size attribute and then multiply the GL point size by this. After that, we need to go into the particle definition, and we'll randomize the particle size, and then we update the geometry with the size so that the value gets passed into the shader. Loading this up, notice the size variation. Some of these are really big, and some are really small. We'll add some color variation next, so we need to go back in, and it's a simple matter of going back into the particle system, defining color as part of the geometry, Add it to the particle definition. Here we'll randomize the RGB values. Then you need to go into update geometry and update the geometry properly from the colors. After that, you add support in the shader by declaring a color attribute. Then you declare a varying attribute, which is a way for a vertex shader to pass values into the fragment shader. In the fragment shader, you essentially want to multiply the texture's color by the particle's color. And once you load it up, the colors are all appearing. I can just kind of spin it around a bit, but you can see there's a lot of different color variation here. Now let's make them fade and blend. So instead of seeing those black squares, we see something a bit more like smoke. 
First thing we want to do is just enable blending. And that's a simple matter of changing the blend mode from no blending back to normal blending. Once we do that, we can see that they're partially transparent. But keep in mind that all we've done is enabled the texture's transparency. We also want to be able to affect how faded each particle is overall. So like the other attributes like color, we're going to be adding a new attribute. Same thing, we modify the particle definition, we modify how the geometry is updated. In this case, we're just going to pack the alpha value along with the color and change color to be a vector of four floats instead of three. Same changes to the shader, we'll just substitute those vec3 for vec4s. Once we run the resulting code, you can make out that some of the particles are a lot more faded out than others. And this is working out great. But what is all this work for? Well, what we've quickly built is a basic particle system. And what you can do now is start animating it. So I'll show you how to do that next. The way we can do that is by going back to the particle definition. And the first thing we need to do is define a lifetime for a particle. That gives you the ability to animate over the lifetime, changing the attributes of the particle however you want. For example, I could easily decide to animate the alpha of each particle to start at zero, build up to one quickly, and then slowly fade away to zero again. Then on top of that, I could say decide to start each particle as blue, make them red, and then green as they fade away. So how did I do this? Easily, we can define a spline with multiple points representing what color or how faded the particle should be at that particular point in the particle's life. I've written this quick linear spline class here, and all it's doing is during the update, it's checking what fade or color value should be assigned to the particle at that point in its life. And of course, you could get a bit more variety by rotating the texture a bit randomly for each particle. So let's go do that. What we're going to do is declare a rotation here in the particle declaration. We'll initialize it to a random value between zero and two radians. Then we do the usual changes, beginning with adding an attribute, and then updating that attribute in update geometry. Now, here in the vertex shader, we take the angle and compute the cosine and sine and pass it down to the fragment shader. Here on this line, we take the 2D texture coordinates and multiply that by a 2D rotation matrix. Now, look at this. The smoke looks a lot more random since we just randomly rotate the texture a bit. Hell, you can even animate this. Back in the code, if we just increment this by a fraction of the frame time, they should rotate a little bit. Loading this up, pretty cool. There's just that tiny bit of movement that makes the particle system look just a bit better. Lastly, let's make them move a bit. So we'll go and add a velocity to the declaration of the particle, and then we'll just update the position here each frame, adding the velocity times the frame time. And we'll also just add some drag here, just to slow the particles down a bit. This isn't a physically accurate simulation, just giving you an idea of what could be done. Let's add the fading back in as well. So I'll uncomment that, and this is kind of looking cool. But it doesn't really look like fire, does it? What we need to do is change the blend mode. Now, blend modes are a totally different discussion altogether, and 3GS supports quite a few options here. But a really basic overview is that there are two ones that are often used, alpha blending and additive blending. The mode that we've been using up until now, normal blending is alpha blending, or what you'd use to do something like smoke. If you want that glowy, fiery look, you'll want to switch this to additive blending, and when we do that, this is looking a lot more fiery. You can kind of look around this at different angles, and it's definitely looking a lot better. So I'm going to load a rocket model in now, and I'll make a few quick changes through the particle system code. We'll animate the size of the flames, starting small and getting bigger. And I do that by adding a spline for the sizes, specifying how big roughly the flame should be at various point in the particle's life. Then I can sample the size here and update particles and multiply it against the current size. I'll make a few other small tweaks here and there, but mostly it's the same as we've been working through. The big difference is I'm going to make the flame shoot down instead of up. And here we go. Once we do all of that, this really helps sell the rocket trail on this rocket. If we wanted to go even further, we could change the flames to turn into ash and smoke. But that also requires us to dynamically switch from additive to alpha blending, which is entirely possible with a more advanced understanding of blend modes. But not today. Definitely in a future tutorial. Hope you enjoyed this. Make sure to like and subscribe as always. Leave a comment and especially let me know if there's a subject you want covered and I'll add it to my to-do list. 
Like always, code is available on GitHub. Grab it and work through it, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.